King Saul. He was the first king of Israel. And uh, I'm reminded as we think of Romans 15.4 that we can learn so much from the Old Testament. Romans 15.4 says, Whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so as we look at one incident in the life of King Saul, I trust that there's some principles here that we can glean that we would find helpful as we seek to walk by faith and honor our Savior. Because what Saul illustrates for us is how not to do the will of God. Now, he was specifically told what the will of God was, and, uh, but he wanted to do it on his terms, and that really never works. And we can be blind to our own shortcomings. We could have a positive volition toward the Lord and yet think we have a better idea than God. And invariably, if you're like me, you have to learn that the hard way. But it's a lesson that is well learned. See, God does not change who he is. Uh, he's not going to change his word for you or for me. He's not going to change what he said. But thankfully, he's incredibly merciful. Thankfully, he is abundant in terms of his grace. And, uh, and he wants your life to count. He wants my life to count. He wants, his desire is that you and, and I would do the will of God. The objective for every human being on this earth is to find, to follow, and to finish the will of God. Um, when the dust settles and the smoke clears and judgment day is upon us, what will be evaluated is going to be directly related to what the will of God was for you and for me. Um, did you do the will of God? We know the will of God is good, it's acceptable, it's well-pleasing uh, to both God and you. Uh, you'll be evaluated as to whether or not you took advantage of the spiritual resources that were available to you because of the riches that are yours in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's what's really going to matter. And in order for you to see the will of God realized in your life, you're going to have to walk by faith. And as we think of Hebrews chapter 11 here, a verse that's on the board, you can read it in your own Bible, uh, a verse that many believers know. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please him, him being God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, many would tell you that the focus of this verse is one's faith, and in particular, faith in the correct object, in this case, God. And we certainly cannot deny the importance of faith relative to this verse, because we're told that without it, it's impossible to please God. Faith is obviously paramount. But chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews is all about examples of those who walk by faith when they were in the middle of God's will, and in many cases had to suffer, in many cases had to endure, in many cases uh, had to go through much difficulty, and yet they're in the hall of fame of faith because they took God at his word. And, uh, and that's really the same for you and for me. But the actual message, verse 6, is sending you and me is related to verse 5. Verse 5 tells us, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. He was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And that is the goal. The goal is to please God. And that's why it goes on to say in verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please God, but it assumes that you understand that the goal in life is to please God. We're to have the mind of Christ. And when Christ walked on this earth as a man, he had one objective. It was to do the will of God and please him. John 8, 29, Christ said, He that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to be for you to say those words. That was his goal. Nothing thrilled him more. And he came to do the will of God. Hebrews 10, 7 says of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, then said I, lo, I come, and the volume of the book it is written to me, all the scriptures say this about me, to do thy will, O God. And so that was his goal. And God wants us all to do the will of God, and the will of God starts with salvation. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4 tells us this is good and and pleases God our Savior who wants. That word wants there is the strongest word in the Greek that speaks of God's will. God cannot more strongly want for you and for me and for all mankind to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's, and these verses go on to say, there is one God, and there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. 
See, the truth needed to be understood when it comes to the will of God and salvation is that there is one God. There is a necessity of a divine human mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, fully God and yet fully human. And the appropriation of salvation by faith. This is what he wants you and I to know. What is a mediator? A mediator is one who intervenes between two, either in order to make or restore peace and friendship or to form a compact or ratify a covenant. We have one mediator between God and man. And Jesus is the only one who qualified because he was God and he was also fully man. So he qualified to be God's representative to man. He qualified to be man's representative to God. And we needed someone to mediate our case because we had a problem called sin. Romans 3 tells us, as is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. We have all turned aside. We have together become unprofitable. In fact, there's not one person who does good in God's eyes. No, not one. We are separated from God in our sin. This is consistent with what we read in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God says, this is my standard. We haven't come close. And because God is just, a penalty needs to be paid for our violation of his holy standard. And so as a mediator, Christ says, I can take care of that for you. In fact, the verse here says that he gave. It's not on the screen, but he gave. And what did he give? Well, he gave himself. And not only did he give himself, he gave himself as a ransom. And he gave himself as a ransom for all, for all men. We needed someone to pay for our sins. If we were to pay for our own sin, we'd have to be separated forever in an unthinkable place of horror called the lake of fire. That's not what God wants. He desires, strongest word in the Greek, all to be saved from that very thing they deserve. And that's what the cross of Christ is all about. Christ was made sin for us or in our place. And there at the cross of Calvary, when the whole world went dark, God's anger, judgment, punishment, wrath, and hatred for sin was poured out on an innocent substitute, the one who qualified to be the Redeemer, the one who knew no sin. <clears throat> so he willingly and lovingly took upon himself all your filth and garbage and all the rest of it because he loved you. And that was the only way your sin and my sin could be paid. What an amazing act of love and grace. It should humble all of us. This is the message that God wants all mankind. This is the truth they need to come to grips with if they're going to spend eternity with God and not spend eternity in hell. See, when Christ was on that cross, he cried out, it is finished. That means your sin penalty, my sin penalty was paid in full. Christ rose from the grave. And what that means is this. The salvation he's offered is offered freely, but it has to be accepted. The only thing that condemns a person is their rejection of the offer of salvation that Christ made. It's accepted on God's terms, which is placing 100% of your trust in him alone, apart from any other work on your part. It's not a matter of you going to church, getting baptized, cleaning up your life, turning over a new leaf, praying a prayer, walking an aisle, raising a hand, asking Jesus in your heart. None of those things save. Christ saves, and he saves when you put your trust in him alone. And the moment you do that, when you recognize what he accomplished for you on the cross, and put 100% of your dependence in him, salvation is received. Eternal life is now yours. You become born again. In fact, God declares you righteous. And if God declares you righteous, then you are righteous. And it's a righteousness that comes in Christ that's put to your account. And then your whole life changes. Your whole perspective in life changes. It becomes so different. Because, by the way, the Bible says you can know you have eternal life. So encouraging to even share that with some people at camp and uh, some kids at Bible school. Very wonderful truth about that. But then your goal in life is to please God. That's what the Spirit of God who takes up residence within you, that's what the new nature that you get the moment you're born again wants you to see, wants you to embrace, and wants you to strive for. That's it. Now, pleasing God requires faith, and this is underscored by the words we're in verse 6. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. So faith is a key ingredient. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And so believe is a verb form of the word faith. And these words underscore, faith is a key component of this. And so your goal as a believer in Christ is to please him. End of story. That's what it is. In fact, when you think of the word please, the word in the Greek really means the same thing as it means in our English language. It means to function in a manner that causes another to be pleased. It means to give pleasure or satisfaction to someone. 
And so when you get up in the morning, ideally the first thought that should jump in your brain is, wow, it's my privilege to please God today. Now, rarely does that happen. Let's be honest. It's like we get up and say, wow, how can I please me today? In fact, how can someone else please me today? That's typically how we default to. In fact, if you're familiar with the book of Colossians, Paul never met them personally before he wrote this letter. And what did, he, what did he say when he prayed for them? He said, for this reason, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And we ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. To what end? That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. For all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who's qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and light. You're to walk worthy of the Lord. A way that is commensurate with your permanent relationship with him and the grace that he has given you and your position in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, if we were to break this down, we could say walking worthy of the Lord means pursuing the goal of pleasing the Lord in everything you do. If you have a different version, it says pleasing him in every respect, in all areas of your life. It means continually bearing the right kind of fruit. God left you here to bear fruit for him, for his glory. It means continually increasing in your knowledge of God. It's growing in the grace and knowledge of the Savior. It means continually receiving God's strength. As Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. And yet, through the Spirit of God, we have enabling power to fulfill the will of God. It means God will build patience and long-suffering into your way of life, and he has to do it. It means continually giving joyful praise to God because of what he's done for us through Christ. These are all the kind of the umbrella of why we're here, why we're functioning. It's not so we can leave our mark on the earth so someone will stand up and take notice. It's about pleasing him. Now, if you're going to do that, it means you must <clears throat> walk by faith. That's it. And walking by faith means doing the will of God. You recognize, you know what, it's not about me, it's about the Lord. It means recognizing that God's will is declared in his word. Thankfully, we have the word of God here that communicates to us what God's will is. It means we take God at his word and we apply it by faith. You do not have a better idea than God. And if you're like me, you've had to learn that the hard way. It means walking in dependence upon Christ. In John 15, the great chapter on abiding, Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. We need him every hour. It's Christ living his life in us and through us that brings honor and glory to him. Again, it doesn't mean you have a better idea than God. It means waiting upon the Lord to deliver you, and it means not taking matters into your own hands. And the reason I say this is because we're going to see that's exactly what Saul does. That, what, that is, depicts his life on earth. And yet he'll be in heaven, and we'll see him one day in a glorified state, and we'll enjoy conversations with him. But because this is so important, Hebrews actually contains a warning. If you go back, several warnings actually, but if you want to look at one in particular related to faith, go back to Hebrews chapter 3. And we can pick it up in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, and he speaks to you through the word. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. And I was angry with that generation. And they said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So you beware, brethren, that's you and me, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But instead, let's exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so the Hebrew believers here, they're suffering. It's not rosy circumstances. They're experiencing persecution for their faith in Christ. In fact, what they're experiencing for their faith in Christ, we really don't have a clue about in terms of anything you and I have ever experienced here in America. And so with that persecution came the temptation to say, you know what, forget it. I've had enough. And he's, so the writer here says, well, think about this Exodus generation. What did they do? They had the same mindset. They wanted to quit. In fact, they had hard hearts, verse 8. And the real problem, again, is the heart. Because he said in verse 10, 
they always go astray where? In their heart. It's a heart issue. When you're complaining to the Lord, when you're not satisfied with your lot in life, or whatever it might be, and you're internally shaking your fist at God, you're, what you're saying is, in essence, you have an evil heart of unbelief. You're doubting the goodness of God. The problem is never with God. He's the solution. And yet this group here had a heart problem. And he's saying, don't do it. In fact, when you think of the goodness of God, James is very clear, every good and perfect gift is from above. Everything good in your life comes from the Lord. He is the source of all that is good, period. In fact, Psalm 119, 68 says, Lord, you are good and you do good. Teach me your decrees. God can't be anything but good. That's why Lamentate, or Psalm 84, 11, and 12 says, The Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them to walk our brother. God is bending over backward to be good. The issue is, are we in a position to acknowledge it and receive it and enjoy it? O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusts in thee, and that's the issue. Lamentations 3.25, the Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. This is what God wants. And we're going to see here, unless David had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, he wouldn't have waited upon him either. That's why we'll see endurance as part of the, the equation. But you develop a hard heart when you say no to God. When the Spirit of God wants to show you your own insufficiency and show you the faithfulness and goodness of God, and you're saying, no, 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 I've got a better idea than you, you're hardening your heart. And notice verse 13. Today, lest any be hardened through the what? Deceitfulness of sin. Deceitfulness of sin. The Spirit of God wants to take the Word of God and show you that you're your own worst enemy and that He has a plan that cannot be improved upon. In our flesh dwells no good thing, and yet everything good belongs with God. And so this is one warning. There's another warning we'll look at briefly. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, the, the Corinthians were carnal, and they were puffed up, and they were proud, and they weren't loving, and so Paul had to address all these issues with them. Because they were puffed up and proud, however, they thought that, you know what? I got this. We're not going to have to worry about God's judgment. We can do our own thing. We can exploit the grace of God. And they were wasting their life. That's why chapter 9 comes to an end. In verses 24 through 27, Paul tells these, run your Christian race in such a way that you, could, that you win. And then he uses himself as an example in verse 27. I discipline my body. I bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. I don't finish the race. I don't do the will of God. And to underscore the importance of this, he uses the illustration, the same illustration the writer of the book of Hebrews used, the Exodus generation. Verse, chapter 10, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I do not want all to be unaware that all their fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. He says, look, he says, the whole nation had all these alls. They had God's leading through the cloud of, and through the fire. They were identified with Moses as the leader. They were given all the spiritual food that they need. They were given physical food and manna. They were given the spiritual drink, the living water himself, all the time. And he would never left them or forsake them. They had all these riches at their, at their disposal. And yet, what does verse 5 tell us? But with most of them, God was not well pleased, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. They were unthankful. They were murmuring. They were complaining. They thought they were entitled to more than they had, and they thought God was their problem. Even though God had did time and time again, every time he gave him the slightest test, what did they do? Oh, life is so hard. Let's go back to Egypt where it was just roses. That's how deceived we are. 
Boy, life was so much better before I got saved. Boy, if you're saying that, man, you're missing it. You are missing it big time. And what's he saying in verse 6? These things became our examples. I'm, he says, read this, folks, and recognize it. To what intent? That we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. But your flesh is never satisfied. Your flesh always wants something different. Your flesh says, I'm tired of this. I've, you know, I've had enough of the manna. Thank you very much. I want some quail. Okay, I'll give you some quail. In fact, he mentions that here. Well, we can just read it. Verse 7, don't become idolaters as some of them did. And, and the Corinthians were having a problem with idolatry. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Let's not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. They had a problem there in that church. And one day 23,000 fell. Let's not test Christ as some also tested him and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. All these things happened to them as examples. And they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so let's, there's the therefore in verse 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. If you don't think that any of this applies to you, you're ripe for a fall, is what he's saying here. You're ripe for a fall. They had the opportunity to walk by faith and please their Savior, and they said no. In fact, why do I even bother? Why do I even bother? Israel failed miserably. And the Spirit of God is using the Apostle Paul to warn us that, you know what? God's got a good and acceptable and perfect will. And it's your privilege to do it. What are you saving yourself for, anyway? Oh, when I get to be 50, I think about serving the Lord. Well, you're going to be half dead like I am, and then what are you going to do? You know? I mean, God's got a good and acceptable and perfect will. He wants your life to count. And so, doing the will of God starts with your volition saying, you know what, my goal is to do the will of God. If you don't ever get there, well, then the rest of it is, I mean, life is then one thing after another. Who here has figured out that life is one thing after another? Everyone over 60, right? There's only four people that figured that out. Someone else, amen me here. Is life one thing after another? Thank you very much. It's one thing after another. And so, if you're not enjoying Jesus Christ, there's something around the next corner ready to rain on your parade, because that's how life goes. And so don't think for a second that you're exempt here from what's mentioned here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For apart from the grace of God, I go the same way. He's saying don't take the mercy of God for granted. Don't exploit the grace of God. Take the will of God seriously. Don't be careless. And one way we do that is to take heed to ourselves. Paul, in telling Timothy, a young pastor, how to be effective in his own ministry, started with himself. He said, you take heed to yourself. That's where it starts. You take heed to the word of God. And then you continue in them. For in doing this, you will both save or deliver yourself and them that hear you as a preacher. And so the Spirit of God is there to always remind us daily we're not sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves. Our sufficiency has to be of God. Without Christ, we can do nothing. I need to daily take heed to myself and say, you know what, man? It's the grace of God. You're breathing air today. And you need Jesus every step of the way. That changes everything. And then you need to recognize that the Word of God is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. This is where the truth I need to think biblically and principally exists. It's not like I'm going to come up with this great idea that God's going to be impressed with. He's given us the Word of God. We're to take heed to ourselves. We're to take heed of the doctrine. And notice we're to do this ongoing. Do this continually. Continually. Because the tendency is to rest in, you know, you go through a trial, you enjoy a victory, and you go, oh, and you kick your feet up and, and mentally check out, and Satan throws a dart, and you're not ready for it, and boom. And the tendency also is to take God's deliverance for granted. And so we let down our guard. 
and we don't take heed to ourselves or we assume that everything's just going to fall into place and when it doesn't, we unravel. We unravel. You know, life is a series of tests daily. If you read Deuteronomy 3, when Moses was uh, rehearsing the history of the nation of Israel, he said, God tested you these 40 years to see what was in your heart. God is doing that perpetually because he cares and he wants our life to count so that we'd see our self-sufficiency is a disaster waiting to happen. And that's what happens to Saul. And so we're going to go here and look at Saul. Here, go with me to the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 13. Joshua judges Ruth, and then First and Second Samuel. So after the... First Samuel 13. A little background. The first, during the time of the judges, Samuel was the last judge. God had a theocracy in place. God was leading the nation. He was using uh, judges to do that, but what characterized the book of Judges was captured in Judges 17, verse 6. It says, every man did what was right in his own eyes. And so there was chaos everywhere. Samuel was old. He was about to die. His sons were corrupt. So the elders in Israel said, you know what? You can't, your sons can't judge us. We want a king because we're not trusting these clones. And God says, you know what? Samuel warned them. You don't want a king. You don't want a king. You think you want a king, but you don't want a king. It's like talking to a... 14-year-old at times, you know? And they said, no, we want a king anyway. And so God says, I'll give you, give you a king, but I guarantee you this, you'll regret it. And sure enough, that did happen because you mess with the bull, you get the horns. That's the way it is. Well, they got king. He was tall, dark, and handsome. This is what the, the people wanted. And he had a good start. He was indwelt by the Spirit of God. He had a first test. He rose to the occasion. The nation rose to the occasion. They won a victory. And so everyone's just hunky-dory happy and great. But who you really are eventually wiggles its way to the top, and who Saul really was started to come to the top when the next test comes, and that's in chapter 13. Now, it's important to recognize as we look in 13 that Samuel left Saul the instructions he was to follow in 1 Samuel 12, 24. So if you want to back up a couple of verses, this is actually our memory work later this year. He says, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. This is to be Saul's mindset as king. Fear the Lord only. Don't walk by sight. Have reverential respect for him. Have a goal of honoring him. Then serve him according to the truth of the word of God. And this is true for all of us. Because disobedience is going to lead to defeat and disgrace and actually death for Saul. Death for Saul. And notice the heart issue here. Do it with all your heart. You're to do it with all your heart. It's a heart issue. If you do this, you'll have great success, he says. In verse 25, but if you do wickedly, you're going to be swept away, both you and your king. So the formula for success is verse 24. You fear the Lord only. Only is there. You be locked in on him and his word. You serve him according to truth. You do it from a heart of thankfulness and gratefulness. And the motivation is just consider how great a God he is and what wonderful things he's done for you. That's it. So let's read here. Well, oh, there it is. I put it up there, didn't I? Only fear the Lord. Serve him with all your truth. Now let's see what the problem is. Verse 13, chapter 13, verse 1. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were in Saul and Mishmash and the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all of Israel heard it, that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel had also had become an abomination to the Philistines, and the people were called to gather to Saul at Gilgal. Again, the Phil Philistines are the 
perpetual enemies of the nation during this time of their history. Verse 5, then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Mishmash to the east of Beth-Avon. Now, when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and pits, they scattered like rats. And some of the Hebrews even crossed over the Jordan to land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. And so the Philistines had gathered together to fight against Israel. And this is like, you know, 50 ants against 5,000 giants is what it is here. So how did Saul respond to the trial? We're going to see here. Verse 7. Or verse 8, rather. Then he, Saul, waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered for him. So he takes matters into his own hands. Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me, and he offered a burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. Now Saul here, what, I mean, on paper you think, what's the big deal? He grabbed a, uh, he made a couple sacrifices and burnt offerings and stuff. But this is the beginning of Paul, Saul's three giant steps downward, the path to defeat. It's going to be unbelief, it's going to be impatience, and it's going to be dishonesty. In fact, Paul's, Saul's first step of failure was his unbelief in God's word here. He didn't wait on the Lord according to verse 7. He was supposed to wait, as we're going to see here, until Samuel got there. So what does Samuel say in verse 11? And Samuel said, what have you done? Hey, man, what are you doing? And he says, well, when I saw the people were scattered for me and that you did not come within the days appointed and the Philistines gathered together in Mishmash, well, then I said, the Philistines are going to come down at me at Gilgal, and I've not made supplication to the Lord. So I felt compelled, and I offered a burnt offering. So people have scattered from Saul. In fact, later in this chapter, it says he's down to 600 men. And they were chicken. They're hiding in caves and thickets and, and all the rest of it. And Sam didn't show up. So you got 3,000. I think it's not actually 3,000 chariots, by the way. That's a typo. You got 6,000 horsemen. You got a boatload of foot soldiers. They're well encamped, and Saul says, you know what, I took matters into my own hands. Isn't that always the temptation? You know, when you're in a trial, it's intense, it doesn't look good, you don't know what to do maybe, and yet you have clear direction for the word of God, but you walk by sight on your focusing on your negative circumstances. And you take matters in your own hands and you come up with your own game plan instead of taking heed to yourself and waiting on the Lord. You know, it's important to remember that your extremity is still God's opportunity. And so the faith says, you know what, I'm going to wait upon the Lord. I'm going to wait for his deliverance. I'm not going to take the bull by the horns. Now, obviously, the outlook is not very bright. I get that. Circumstantially, this is like a disaster waiting to happen. But the answer is always the same. Remember two springs ago, I had a conversation with an individual who was single and lonely and wanted some companionship. And I said, what's your alternative here? Go out and date some uncircumcised Philistine? Some heathen? And like, that's going to work out? That's unbelief. God's very clear in his word. You shouldn't be unequally yoked. Why do you think he's going to change his word for you? He's not. It never works. So Samuel's question to Saul was, what did you do? What were the first three words of Saul's response? Verse 11, when I saw. What was he focusing on? When I saw. He was not focusing on his God. He was focusing on his trial. And you know, unbelief will cause you not to believe in the faithfulness of God. You're not going to wait upon him. You're not going to wait upon him. See, the instructions Saul was given for his whole kingship were given to him right after he became king. It's in 1 Samuel 10.8. This is always what he was to do. 
You shall go down before me, Samuel's telling this to Saul, and surely I will come to you down to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you, and I'm going to show you what to do. God says, I'm going to make your life easy. This is all you got to do, man. You go to Gilgal, you wait for Samuel, and he'll tell you what to do. I mean, wouldn't, I would, oh, if I could only have that promise. I'll go to Gilgal, I'll camp there, man. Lord, I'm waiting. Because I'm going to screw it up. And so, seven days goes by, and he's a half a day late in Saul's eyes. So what does he do? I mean, this is it. This is all he had to do. And faith says, I'm going to wait on the Lord. Panic says, no way, I've got to fix this thing now. God, you're taking too long. God, you're not going to provide a favorable outcome. I cannot trust you. I better move in here. You know, it's interesting because if you look at chapter 12, verse 14, when Samuel was giving instruction, what did he say? If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and your king who reigns over you will continue to follow the Lord your God. Remember, fear the Lord, serve him, wait at Gilgal, don't rebel against the commandment, it'll be good. What do you... What's he say in verse 20, I think? Then Samuel said to the people, do not fear, you have done this wickedness. The wickedness there was wanting a king for yourself. Don't turn aside from Father and Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. There's the same admonition. Don't turn aside, for then you will go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. And so the instruction was clear. The instruction was clear. Samuel told him, only fear the Lord. And when you're fearing the Lord, you're rever reverentially waiting upon him. You believe he is who he is, and his word is true. But why shouldn't that be tested? Why shouldn't that be tested? It should be tested. You know, God is for you. He can't be against you. He spared not his own son. He delivered him up for you. It says, how shall not with him also freely give you all things? You know, when you're waiting on the Lord, that means you're casting your care upon him because he cares for you. And there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Those who don't wait on the Lord experience that very principle. And so we saw the command he was given was to fear the Lord and obey him and wait for him. But Saul's second step of failure was his failure to wait upon the Lord. You know, faith and endurance always go together in the Bible. Faith and endurance always go together. Think of Hebrews 6 here. What's the admonition? That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through what? Faith and patience inherit the promises. But I got to wait. Yeah, you got to wait. You know, I don't know anyone that has ever said, gee, I wish I wouldn't have waited upon the Lord. You know, after they waited and God faithfully delivered at the right time and the right way for his glory. I wish I would have just bypassed the whole thing and taken a shortcut. Nobody says that. But boy, has the opposite been said. You know, later in this epistle, he says, don't cast away your confidence, a word for faith, faith in the Lord, which has great reward. God says, when you get to heaven, I guarantee it'll be worth it. Paul said the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. It ain't worth, you know. I mean, when the sun came out yesterday afternoon after, you know, we got home, it was rainy and ishy, and it was rainy and ishy, and the sun came out and went, oh, you know what, the sun comes out and you forget about the rainy and the ishy. It's the same thing. You have need of what? Endurance. So after you've done the will of God, you're going to receive the promise. Faith and endurance go together. In fact, put a marker here. Hmm. Let's go to James 1 for a second.
James wastes no time getting into the meat of his epistle. In verse 2 of chapter 1, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Verse 3. Knowing the testing of your faith produces patience or endurance. You know what? If everything, you got everything on your timetable right when you wanted it, you th I mean, that would be like a disaster. You'd turn into a snot. You'd think you're entitled to it. Like, what, what business do I have waiting for anything? But God says, guess what? I am going to test your faith because it produces endurance. And then you're to let that endurance, verse 4, have its completed work because God's got something he wants to do through your waiting that cannot be accomplished other than through the waiting. So you can be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Maturity without endurance is an impossibility. You need the trial. But I don't want the trial. Well, that means you don't want to be mature and you want to remain a babe spiritually. That's not good. See, Saul was not willing to wait. God says, I'm going to give you a trial here. I want you to just wait for me because my word is true. Can't do it. I rushed ahead. I rushed ahead. Yeah, look at all these promises. Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. David said this. I would have lost heart. I said, I'm at the end of my rope. Unless I what? Had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of If I didn't believe God is who he is, I would have just lost it. But since God is who he is, I didn't lose it. So what's his recommendation to you and me? Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he'll strengthen your heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. And the Lord knows what he's doing, and he wants to be gracious to you. Isaiah 30, 18 says what? Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious to you. That's why he waits. He can show his grace in a way that wouldn't be shown apart from the wait. And therefore he will be exalted, that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who what? Wait for him. Wait for him. That's why James 1.12 says this. Blessed is the man who endures the testing. For when he has been approved, he will see a crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. You want to get blessed? Endure. If you want to forsake the blessing, don't endure. That's your business. And who is the ones? Notice, who are the ones that endures? Those who what? Love him. The key to enduring is loving your Savior. Mind in Revelation 2.10, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will make it worth your while. Same crown. Crown of life. How are you going to do that? By having a love affair with your Savior. That's it. Are you doubting the goodness of God? I mean, here, the, Jesus Christ is saying, love me enough to die for me, and I'll, be, I'll make it worth your while. Do you love your Savior enough to die for him? He loved you enough to die for you. And he's making an appeal. His love for you will never stop. He doesn't love you because you're lovely. He loves you because he's lovely. But he says, boy, if you love me, and you endure, I'll make it worth your while. Well, let's go back to 1 Samuel and see his next problem. His third step of failure was this problem of dishonesty. Dishonesty. He takes the posture of making excuses. Isn't that what he said in verse 11? 
This is my excuse. I saw the people were scattered for me. You didn't come within the days appointed. And the Philistines were barking at my heels. First he blames his army. They left me. Then he blames Samuel. You were late. Then he says, I got negative circumstances here. I got three good reasons why I'm not going to wait for the Lord. What are your three good reasons? Do you blame others for your problems? You know, if they would treat me better, then I wouldn't blah, blah, blah. Do you refuse to do the right thing before the Lord because it's inconvenient? You know, we live in America, and convenience is the mantra of the day. If it's not convenient, why should I bother, right? You know, when things get hard, it's very easy for us to just throw biblical principles to the curb because we're used to having it easier than we probably should. You know, it's interesting. Saul never said he misunderstood the instructions. He knew what the instructions were. He was practicing the ends justifies the means. It'd be one thing if you didn't know what the right thing to do was, but when you know the right thing to do is, and you say, forget it, I'm going to do it. That's deadly. And you know what? He'd rather die than admit he's wrong. Can you admit you're wrong? I spent some time with the young people going over, let's practicing admitting we're wrong. I was wrong. The word doesn't come out of their mouth. Reminds me when I lived in Duluth before I was married, I had four guys live with me. I had a big house. And, and one day I came home and someone had broken the blender, but they put it together perfectly so you'd never know it was broken. And so you go to use it and the whole thing... And I had a sneaking suspicion who did it, so I figured it out, and I came up to him, and I said, hey, did you break the blender? This is his answer. You know what the problem is around here? There's not enough counter space. <laughs> I, I almost started laughing. It's like, I will never say the words, I was wrong, or I did it. It was so classic. Oh, we laugh later. Can you admit you're wrong? The problem was not a mu the counter space had nothing to do with it. He broke the blender but didn't want to say the words, I was wrong. And you know what? It's easy for us to justify our wrong decisions, isn't it? Saul here's got a great justification. I got three good reasons, man. You can't argue with any of them. Okay. Uh, you disobeyed God. And you know what? If you are in a pattern where you won't admit you're wrong before the Lord and you have to be right all the time, and you're always justifying your decision, not only are you a miserable human being, but you're going nowhere spiritually. It's a fixed principle. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper. End of story. But he who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Would you rather have prospering and mercy, or would you rather die than admit you're wrong? When you're always trying to justify yourself to make yourself look good or whatever it might be, you're going nowhere spiritually. See, the beauty of grace is that, you know what, man, I screwed up. And God loves me anyway. And he's forgiven me. Isn't it great? Grace can allow you to be transparent and say, you know what, wow, I screwed up. Yeah, I broke the blender, man, sorry. And then the the real manly thing was says, yeah, I'll, I'll get another one for you. But that never happened either. <laughs> you know, if you wouldn't have done this, then I wouldn't have blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I read somewhere where someone said, he said, a person who is, is good at making excuses is rarely good at anything else. That's kind of painful, isn't it? What was the, remember, all Saul had to do 
was have the mindset of verse 12, 24, fear the Lord, right? Serve him in truth with all your heart. That's all he had to do. He had to wait at Gilgal. God would have been faithful. So what does Samuel say, verse 13? Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. Ooh, foolishly. In fact, this is the indictment. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. Now the Lord would have established your kingdom for, over Israel forever, but now your kingdom will not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Very simple. Very simple commands. He knew what the will of God was. He didn't do it. So Samuel's conclusion is that you did foolishly. You did foolishly. What was the consequence of that, consequence of that foolish decision? The kingdom was taken from him. Now he reigned another 38 years or so. But at that point in time, the decision was made. You know, when you don't walk by faith and wait on the Lord, we can say the same thing. You've done foolishly. And we reap what we sow. That's why James 4.17 says, Him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. But notice the issue that Samuel made was not his performance, it was his heart condition. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. His own heart. He made the issue the heart. In fact, later he says, I think it's in chapter 15, he says, I, the Lord's going to take the kingdom and give it to a man who's better than you. Now, what makes one man better than another? Was David better than Saul intrinsically? No. It was the condition of his heart. The issue was the heart condition. Saul was impulsive. Saul didn't wait on the Lord we learn about how David was put through all kinds of trials time and time again and how he looked to the Lord. He waited upon the Lord. Now, obviously, he had his major screw-ups, but what did he do? He admitted those. He owned them. You know, God doesn't expect you not to screw up. He expects you to fully screw up. The issue is your heart condition. Are you willing to own your screw-up and say, you know what, Lord? I, I functioned outside of you, and I blew it. What do you know? But thank you that when I admit this to you, that it's wiped clean, and we can go forward in perfect fellowship and joy. That's called grace. That's called freedom. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. See, Psalm 78, 72 says, David shepherded them with in, the integrity of his heart, and with skillful hands he led them. That's not said about Saul. In fact, it only gets worse for Saul. Saul becomes more enamored with himself, and the rest of his life, he's chasing David and trying to make a name for himself, and he's competing with someone else, and he envies everyone else. He's a miserable wretch. Why? Because it was about him, and it wasn't about the Lord. It's amazing, isn't it? Here's a scary question. If I were to ask those who know you well, and I asked them, I said, well, are they quick to take responsibility for themselves or are they quick to make excuses and justify themselves? What would they say? You know, that's why God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. It's so much easier to go through life saying, you know what, wow, apart from the grace of God, I can't tie my shoes. And yet, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Versus, how dare you think I'm a low-life guy that can't tie his shoes? Saul had skill. He lacked integrity. He was not a man of faith. When he was put to the test, what was in his heart rose to the top. And when David was put to the test, what was in his heart rose to the top. And he was teachable. In fact, the Psalm 32, when he confesses, God says, I will guide you with my eye. Don't be like a horse. Don't be like a mule. Allow me to guide you with your eye, my eye. 
And so as you think of this, this whole passage here, you know, you have to first of all settle in your mind that you want to do the will of God. If you don't want to do the will of God, you can hear the Bible all day long and it's not going to make a dime's worth of difference in your life because you're going to pick and choose what you like and might think is helpful so you can make your life the way you want it to be. Or you can say, you know, Lord, here I am. Use me. My goal in life is to please you because you gave your all for me and I deserve to go to hell in a handbasket and I don't have to go. And your will is good and acceptable and perfect and I don't want anything outside of that, and I want my life to count. That's where it starts. If, you know, if, if that isn't settled in your mind, then life is one thing after another. And then when you do decide that, are you willing to wait upon the Lord? Are you going to only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart as you consider what great things he has done for you? And then your life counts for something. Then God says, you're in a position where I can work in you and through you and I can transform you and make you into the image of Christ and I can use you to have an impact on someone else's life. And, and this is what's going to mean something when the dust settles and the smoke clears and we all stand before our Savior. This is what it's all about. You know, God has never failed a trusting heart. That's impossible. And if Saul would have waited on the Lord here, he would have tasted and seen God's deliverance. God would have gotten the glory. God would have been exalted. Everyone would have rejoiced in the Lord. And that's how God wants it to be. So there was a warning to the Hebrews. There was a warning to the Corinthians. Let's take heed to ourselves. Let's take heed to who our Savior is, let's take heed of the word of God. Let's have humble hearts and allow him to direct our steps for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we're just challenged as we consider this passage here and this illustration of King Saul. We know that we are what we are by the grace of God. We have no right to look at Saul and say, what a loser, because we know that apart from you, uh, we're no different in any way, shape, or form. But thank you that you're the God of all grace, you're the God of all mercy, the God of all love and kindness, and you love us supremely, and you're the God of multiple chances. And I pray our hearts would be humble that we'd take even First uh, Samuel twelve twenty four to heart. We'd have hearts that want to reverence you, and hearts that want to serve you in truth, and hearts that would consider the great things you've done for us, especially through the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that not only did he die in our place and pay for our sins and rise from the dead, but he seeks, he's given us all things to pertain in life and godliness, and he seeks to live his life in us and through us. And may we see the riches that are ours in him. May we humbly present ourselves to you as living sacrifices and even put to the test that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we thank you for our study. In Jesus' name, amen.